question. Do we have our translator with the handle? Okay. Do we do we have our our translation? Um, Hafiz is getting it all hooked up right here. Okay. I'm, I'm waiting because I, I want to make sure that the translation, um, the audio translation, uh, is available to anyone who wishes it. <laughs> to the back of an auditorium. All right. Okay, so um, I want to take a look at the agenda and have you take a look at that and um, approve it. Motion to approve. Any discussion? Okay. Um, all those in favor of approving the agenda as written, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, take a look at the minutes, please. These are the same that previously sent to us? As a draft. Okay, any discussion? No questions? Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes as written, please say aye. 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 Okay. All right, so um, we'll now have public comments. Parent of TAS since 1994 and grandparent. 
Health Services Coordinator since 2007, SEIU Local 99 Chief Steward of the Classified Staff since 2010, Taz and Wa School Site Council Chair. When I began my employment in 2007, I quickly discovered that my services were greatly needed. I understood why Kevin Savet, co-founder of the Accelerated Schools, desperately sought me out. There were students that, being, that weren't being properly medicated per doctor's orders. Immunization compliance was a huge concern, coupled with a lack of health policies and procedures. I quickly jumped into my role at TAS with ease. Given my background as an Esperanza Community Health Promotora, LAUSD Healthcare Advocate, and USC Head Start Health Services Coordinator, those roles enabled me to provide and perform the duties and responsibilities to the students at TAS and directly provide them health services, which, were, which are in dire need. I developed many policies and procedures throughout my tenure at TAS which weren't solely health related. I have, been an, I have had an excellent track record for close to 12 years of service at TAS. I have dedicated my personal and professional career to ensuring that TAS keeps our mission and vision alive for years to come. I wasn't shocked, but definitely disappointed with the manner in which my long-standing employment with TAS was terminated abruptly without notice and no negotiations or discussions with my union representatives via email on July 11, 2019. I am here today surrounded by my children and my community to ask the court to reinstate me in my position as health service coordinator effective immediately as I have done nothing wrong but care and advocate for my community. I do not deserve, deserve this unjust treatment by this board and school officials. Thank you. I just came to comment, um, I know from the last board meeting that we uh, moved our organizational goal, our first organizational goal to accelerate learning. And um, I'm coming to thank the board, first of all, for that priority. And I also want to come to speak on the huge, massive organizational shift that has occurred this year. Um, our team has already have 80 informal observations, multiple workshops, and I would say this is probably one of the first years where I say that instruction is truly our focus. Uh, with the addition of the directors, the directors have taken on a lot of duties that the principals and the, uh, the assistant principals would often do, and so our focus is in the classroom, preparing workshops and supporting teachers, uh, so that we can move that to our priority at the school and accelerate learning. So I want to thank the board and I want to thank the support team today for making that a focus. Um, I want to thank the directors for being good coaches and for being in our walkthroughs, being in our administrative meetings and giving us feedback and helping us improve so that we can get better, uh, so that we can have better results in the future. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Benning. Appreciate that. Um, by the way, are we recording this? Okay, I just wanted to make sure that everybody, I, I apologize, I have forgotten to mention this. We are recording our board meetings at this point so that when January comes and we're required to do that and post the recordings on our website, we will have had an opportunity to work out the bugs and figure out how to make that really uh, possible for all of us. So it is being recorded. Just audio or audio video? Audio at this point. Okay. Um, Justin, this one. Good morning. My name is Justin Guzman. I am Hilda's youngest child and former student of the Accelerated Schools. This Board of Education is well, well aware of my struggles at TAS and Healthcare since my mother has advocated for me and for other students with disabilities. My mother has given me the courage and strength to stand here today and speak. She taught me that my struggles don't define me and make me stronger and resilient. She has taught me to never give up and speak my truth without conviction. 
As you well aware, high school is built on the bonds you make. However, in Taz's case, it's been extremely difficult. Due to the constant teacher and staff yearly turnover, how is this institution supposed to promote a welcome and safe environment when the students are constantly greeted by strangers each and every year? My mother is one of the last remaining pillars of unity within Taz. As she has developed a deep connection with this community, she has helped countless of people, which includes students, staff, and parents alike. Sadly, I knew this day would come. With her termination, as, with her termination I no longer see that unity Taz once had. What I see now is fear mongering because you all are afraid that she's providing a voice for the voiceless. What she has done is demanded that TAS keep its promise to provide a quality education and serve the students equally. This board in turn chose to unjustly terminate my mother's position, which she loves so dearly. In close, I join my mother, siblings, and community to ask this board to reconsider its decision and give my mom her job back that she's had for 11 plus years. I attended the Accelerated School since its inception. I actually recognize the faces here. Kindergarten through 12th grade. It was, I was the first of the first graduating class of Wallace and Number High School in 2007. Um, I am the mother of a second grade student attending ACES, and I am Hilda's eldest child. I join my mother and my siblings here today to state that I am heartbroken and dismayed by the board's decision to wrongfully terminate my mother's employment from TAS, as they have done so to many of the teachers that I had throughout the years. She is compassionate, dedicated, hardworking, and a strong supporter of quality in public schools. Um, and that they all that they serve all, especially this neighborhood in which we've lived our entire lives. She's always looking out for the best interests of others. She has instilled in all of us the importance of advocating for ourselves and has been an exceptional role model for me as a mother. This ordeal has been difficult for our family given that my mother has given so much and our lengthy history with Taz and this community. Words cannot express my disappointment with the board and its grossly unethical treatment of my mother simply because she has advocated for my siblings and my child. I ask this board to reconsider its decision to reinstate my mother in her position that she's held since 2007, um, soon after I graduated from WAS. Thank you for your time. Um. Sylvia Venegas. Good morning once again, Sylvia Venegas. I'm a member of ACE and I am the president of our education chapter where Hilda holds a vice presidency. She's brought in so much um, knowledge and information and support to our community as well, not just to your accelerator program. She's a pillar of our community, especially in our special education. And what this board has done unjustly is firing her by, by mail just proves to show how um, on opposite sides you guys are. And you guys really need to know that she is a very important asset into this um, school, as she has mentioned before. And you guys um, really need to reconsider that because she brings a lot more than just special education and community values into um, not just this space, in a broader area as well. So you guys really need to reconsider what you guys are doing. Ms. Venegas, could you help us understand what ACE is? Alliance for California Community Empowerment. Okay, and are there different chapters throughout California? We definitely do. We focus on um, tenants, homeowners, and education. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's the first time I believe I've, I've been aware of ACE. I you can look us up on Facebook and join our, our page. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Venegas. Okay, and finally we have... Um, is it Beverly Roberts or Roberts? Beverly Roberts. Beverly Roberts. Good morning, everybody. As I said, my name is Beverly Roberts, and I'm the chair for the Home Defenders League in Ace. I've been with Ace for nine years, and we work for the community. But I'm here to support Hilda 
And from what I've heard, I don't understand what all of this. I've only gotten bits and pieces, but I'm here to support her because she works hard in the army and we support her. So whatever it is you need to do, you need to do it. But also I want to ask you this. Is this all the board members? Or just a few? Um, all but two. Okay, but why is there no more diversity? Two? Why is there no more diversity in our community? Why is it? Can you answer me that? This is public comment, so we don't need to Well, this is this public, point. and I'm in the public, and you're in our community. So you need to answer me that. Why isn't there no more diversity since you're in our community? Why? I, I, when I walked in here, I said, mm -hmm. no wonder they fired the girl. You better think about it because you're going to pay for it. I'm really pissed because this don't make no sense. Okay, um, Victoria Enriquez. Victoria Enriquez. Okay. <coughs> I'll try to stay for her. Okay, with translation, with translation, you get you get twice as much time. Con la traducción le dan cuatro minutos para que pueda hablar. Buenos días, mi nombre es Victoria Enriquez. Yo vengo a apoyar a la, a la señora Hilda. Her name is Victoria Enriquez, and here she's here to support uh, Hilda Rodriguez. Que no es posible que le hayan quitado su trabajo. It's not possible for you guys to have taken the employment away. No sé lo que ella siente, porque yo cuando trabajé en una compañía también me hicieron lo mismo. She understands the feeling because she was in a company. Siente. She received the Por same treatment. Por favor, regresen de su trabajo. La She's persona a... que está trabajando, que se quede también. No, no la saquen de su trabajo, que se queden las dos personas. Por favor. She's asking Las... for, her to, for you guys to give her back her employment. But only about her, not to let go of the other person who's also assisting her. Porque no es posible que tiene muchos años trabajando acá y de repente le quiten su trabajo. It's not possible for her to have been here such a long time and for you guys to take her job away. Es lo que le estamos pidiendo a ustedes que le regresen su trabajo, por favor. We're asking you to give her back her employment. Porque ella, yo sé lo que se siente cuando a uno la, la destinan de su trabajo. Se siente uno muy mal. She understands how she feels being without an employment after it's been taken away. She feels bad. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Um, Angela Jimenez. Good morning, my name is Angelina Jimenez, member of ACE. Estoy aquí para apoyar a la maestra Hilda. I'm here to support teacher Hilda. Porque no creo que si ella hubiera sido una mala maestra, la hubieran despedido antes, no hoy. I don't believe that if she was a bad teacher, you guys would have fired her a long time ago, not recently. Estoy aquí porque sé que los niños la necesitan. Y también ustedes, porque ustedes necesitan personas competentes. She knows she's here because she knows not just the children, but you guys also need her here because you guys need confident people. Nosotros siempre hemos estado a favor de la niñez, de que los niños tengan los mejores maestros, que tengan los mejores útiles, todo lo que necesitan y también mentalmente. She values children and their education and also knows that she, we need the support for them, and which is something that she's been providing. Entonces, por favor, les pido que dejen a la maestra en su puesto y también a la enfermera que tienen hoy. You need to put her back in her position and also the nurse that you guys have. Muchas gracias y yo ojalá lo piensen de verdad. Thank you and think about it truthfully. Um, Anita Nishman. Good morning. 
for your records, my name is Anita Miklen, N-I-C-K-L-E-N. And I'm a registered voter uh, who has always supported all the initiatives to bring more money to schools. I'm a taxpayer and also uh, I own a home. I'm here in support of Hilda Rodriguez. Uh, I think that she has shown that she's a very qualified employee with a lot of experience and that's what the children need in our community. She cares about, um, she cares about the children a lot. Um, she has, uh, she's an asset in our community. Uh, she has been working um, with us in many issues. It's wrong that she was terminated. Please give her the job back. And a second petition here. Please respond to one of the uh, ASA leaders or ACCE leaders um, with the question that she raised about diversity in this you know, school board. Thank you so much. Uh, Maria Sanchez. <coughs> Buenos días. Good morning. Mi nombre es Maria Sanchez. Soy madre de dos niños que participan en las escuelas aceleradas. Vivo en esta comunidad hace más de 16 años y vivo activamente por más de 16 años en esta. Hey, good morning, my name is uh, Maria Sanchez. I'm a mother of two children who are also in accelerated schools. And I work in this community, in the school, and she's very active for more than 16 years. Yo siempre he pensado que la escuela es como un reloj y que cada engrane y cada rondana es importante para su buen funcionamiento. She's always um, thought of the school as a watch. And every part, every screw has a fundamental and valuable piece of um, function. Hoy quiero hablarles de la señora Isla. La conozco hace más de 10 años. Ella es la causa de que yo y muchos padres tengan a sus hijos en las escuelas asignadas. She wants to refer to Ms. Hilda Rodriguez as to why her children have been in the schools and accelerated programs. Ella impactado mi vida porque me ha enseñado los derechos de madre, de hija. Pero no solo eso, me ha enseñado a no rendirme, a luchar, a buscar una mejor educación para los niños de nuestra comunidad. Hilda has uh, brought on to her a lot of education and empowerment on how to speak up and how to advocate for her children. She's very grateful for her also in impacting her in her own life. Creo que Hilda debe de regresar a la escuela y hacer un buen equipo con la enfermera que ahora tiene. She wants Hilda to come back to her job and work hand in hand with the nurse that they have and make a great team. Pienso que para la otra enfermera tres escuelas para ella sola no es it's unjust for the other nurse to have three schools just for one person. Pienso que la señora Hilda conoce a nuestros hijos más que todos ustedes juntos y que la nueva enfermera. Hilda knows all the children in the school more than you guys will or the nurse or have and the nurse either. Porque ella los ha visto crecer en la escuela y en nuestra comunidad. She has seen them grow not just in the school but also in our community. Creo Estoy enfrente de un grupo de personas que son sabias y honestas, que son ustedes. She feels she's in a room of wise people like yourselves. Y sé que van a tomar la mejor decisión, pero yo les repito y les repito, nosotros también somos parte de esta escuela porque somos los padres. But I'm going to repeat over and over that we are the parents of this school and you guys have to listen to us as well. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn Cabrera. Hello, good morning. My name is Marilyn Cabrera. I was a former student here in the accelerated school, graduated class in 2017. Hillsborough has not only been a pillar in our community within our school, but in our community outside of school as well. 
She has not only brought light many issues that have been ongoing and have not been dealt with, but she has taught parents more about this, well, which I feel is a lack of carelessness within our school system. A school that prided itself as one of the best schools in South Central LA. It was a school that you heard among parents, I want my child to go to that school. I want my child to receive the best education possible. Hilda has not only Can you have you turn off your phones, please? I mean, you can film all you want, but if you have a ringer, if you turn the ringer down, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Hilda has taught many parents to raise their voices as to when they felt they could not because of their lack of knowledge, not only as to what are the rights, but what was going on in school. I believe that Hilda should be reinstated in tax because she has been very courageous as her coming out on her own, helping educate people, bringing the youth together. As you hear the parents here, they, we feel very strongly for Hilda because it not only comes from a place that we know her as a person, but as a person who wants better for everyone, for kids, for teachers, and as we have seen, she has shown that. Being an activist within our community, advocating for everyone. <laughs> And our last um, person, um, is it Georges Roman? Good morning, folks. Y'all yeah. should be really ashamed of yourselves. Every single one on this board should be ashamed of yourselves. All the wealth, all the talent, all the privilege in this room, and you choose to pick on a beloved South LA grandmother. Is this what we've come to? Twenty-five years. Three children that have gone through tasks. All the countless volunteer hours, trying to improve the school. And it's your fault. That's what your HR director has said. Yeah. This came from all of you. So it's all of your responsibilities to fix this. While on medical leave, via email, the cruelest way to treat people who've been pillars of task. No tienen madre. No tienen madre. So he said you don't have a mother. Shame on all of you. Shame, shame on you. 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 Shame. Shame. No diversity. Shame. No parents. Very purposely. No diversity on this board. Two Nashima parents that got elected to this board never got the opportunity to serve. Shame on you. 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 Embarrassing. Yeah. In our community, yes. you guys coming to this community and have no diversity. No. Where are all the parents? Why don't we have more parents listening to what's happening? 
because they're Why don't they have the opportunity to be here? You know, you've them. had the opportunity. Yes, yes. yes. we have. For your Thank you. minutes. We appreciate it. And we're going to move yes, the agenda will. along. <laughs> yes, sir. Madam President, we are ready for the Chief Executive Officer's report on the agenda, and we're going to be introducing a couple of new staff members, members of the board. Our first introduction is Mr. Robert Canosa Carr. He likes to be called Bobby, and he is rounding out our team as our secondary director of education. He started his educational career as a high school English teacher for LAUSD, and after numerous years, Mr. Canosa Carr was promoted to LAUSD Central Office as the English language arts content specialist. He then served as assistant principal of two high schools with multiple tracks, and Mr. Carr is a seasoned high school principal. We'll be back! We will be back! back. And this will we'll be back! The whole community will be will back! We will be back! Be back. We'll, we'll be back! back. We'll, we'll be back! back. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Conosa Carr as our Director of Secondary Education. Sorry, your introduction was interrupted, but Bobby, no board. Bobby, would you like to say a couple of words to our board? Sure. Just thank you very much for bringing me on board. It's an honor to be able to work with this organization. It's been my passion throughout my career to provide opportunities for traditionally underserved children to get a world-class education. That was why I chose to join this organization because I believe that vision that I have for myself and my career is very much in alignment with the leadership we have in this organization. So I thank you for the opportunity to work with you to do that. Um, we also have our two college and career ready counselors. Those are new positions supporting our high schools. Um, it is Daisy, Dr. Pong, would you mind doing the introduction for your two college and career ready counselors? Sure. Um, this is Daisy Flores and this is Jacob Palm. So there are two counselors and um, for this year, so the way that we split it up is Mr. Palm has ninth and eleventh grade students, and then Ms. Daisy Flores has the tenth and the twelfth grade students working alongside Ms. Zelaya in terms of providing support for all the seniors this year. So, and your staff members. Thank Welcome you. Welcome aboard. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Daisy. And then our last introduction will be with our director of HR. We'd like to introduce our new nurse. Yeah, so we have a, a, a new district RA. She started August 1st. Um, she's not present here this morning, um, but uh, Sylvia Castro, and she has over 20 years of uh, medical experience. She actually started as a medical assistant at Kaiser over 20 years ago. So we're really excited to have her on board. She will be serving, she'll be housed out of task, and she'll be serving all three schools. We're excited to have her. Okay. I wish you were here. Welcome. I know. But I'm sure as a nurse, she's very busy. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to move into the President's report. And um, I'm, how many of you had the opportunity to listen to the audio? I did not, of, of our last meeting. Okay, well, I guess it's pretty instructive. It captures everything we say, so. <laughs> All right, so uh, we, what we did uh, at the last board meeting was have the board identify two priorities for board goals to help direct the focus for this particular year in the actual operations. So, uh, Grace, I'd like to turn this over to you. Actually, it's yep. under 11 o'clock, um, under board goal discussion. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Well, we're going to review those in 11. Okay. Uh, parent representative nomination process. In your board packet, under the president's report, uh, the first item is the parent board represent representative nomination and election process. One of the things that we realized was that we needed to have a consistent and coherent election process, nomination and election process, for parents to serve on the board across all three schools. In the past, the schools have been doing things a little bit differently, and we wanted to codify this. And because the parents would be joining the board, we wanted to have the board nomination committee um, responsible for part of this process. So you'll see, if you have the opportunity to read this, um, you'll see that our purpose was to really make sure that our parents were represented on the board, that the parents will be able to contribute to the overall vision and mission of the accelerated school, and that they are nominated, elected, and approved by their school's population and the full board consistent with past governing, uh, governing board bylaws. We formed a group and we asked the principals to develop a nomination form with these particular uh, qualifications, which you'll find on the next page, um, and encourage and recruit parents from across their school to apply to be on the board as a parent representative. Those applications are coming in now. They will be um, collected fairly soon. We're hoping that the board nomination committee, which is Leonard, myself, and Binti, we do have some diversity on the board, unfortunately, they're just not here. Um, and we will take a look at what the nomination um, applications look like, which will include a resume, a statement of intent, and how they feel they can really help the accelerated schools um, by being on the board, and then we will, the nomination committee will review those and get back to the principals about people we feel, the parents we feel are eligible to serve. And um, that is part of this, so the nomination committee, step four, will review those, and then at, this, at a subsequent governing board meeting, our next would be in September, that is going to be a call-in so one of the assumptions we're making is that if the board nomination committee approves these parents to stand for nomination at their individual schools, and they are elected by their school population at a formally held meeting, which is part of the bylaws, that then we would assume that the rest of the board would feel comfortable doing it on a consent item. Okay, so I just... The dates will change. One of the things we're interested in doing is having these elections be at the end of the school year so that we can engage parents early in the summer with onboarding and helping to train them so that they become more verbal and um, able to assist us on the board. So eventually we're hoping to change that timeline. Again, the timeline then would have our parent representatives starting at the beginning of the school year, rather than in the middle of the school year in December where we've had all of these things going on and then they come on board and they really don't have as much context as they need in order to be viable board members and um, be with us. So one of the things we're looking at is just changing that particular timeline. So whole board votes. That would be by consent, we're hoping, in September. Um, and the new parent board representatives will be welcomed onto the board, and they will um, have an onboarding. And um, that is this particular action item, and I would open this up for discussion. So for this first year, what is the timeline again, please? The timeline, the elections are set to be um, mid-September. So that means each of the individual schools after our committee has taken a look at the, at the paperwork. 
Yes. And so the timeline would be then, September they would be approved, and then I would do an onboarding with them in early October so that they can be seated in October and then spend the rest of the year with us. We've encouraged the parents who have applied before to apply again with this new nomination process. And parents have previously applied for the number? Um, we don't have all of the applications in right now. Perhaps do, do we have? Um, I believe TAS has two with two more coming. Um, I'm not sure about ACEs and WAS. Have we, have we had any um, people volunteer to be on the board yet? Yeah, she's pushed some ACEs or what? Yeah, she's looking at the, at, the, at the numbers, maybe four or five. Maybe four or five from the high school? From ACEs. Yeah, four or five from ACEs. Oh, from ACEs, sorry. And we're still working on getting some from the high school. Okay, good deal. May I ask a question? Go back. Go, go ahead. The, uh, the nurse that we hired, her level is, is she, did I hear you say she was an RN? She's an RN, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, any other questions or discussion on this new nomination process? We get a motion. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that was everybody. Okay, so that passes. Thank you very much. Next, school as a whole. This is an information item. One of the things that the accelerated school um, had as part of its principal organizing feature when Hank Levin developed the model was that if it were one school and you had different grade levels and different departments, each of those different grade levels and departments would have their own special issues but that to bring everyone together for a school as a whole, because there are going to be some issues that are overarching. Well, this is a small district, and with this particular group of schools, we have overarching issues that go beyond individual school issues that affect the entire community. So one of the things we wanted to do was, and when I say we, we had a committee that was working on this, and it included Grace, excuse me, this is Chang, our CEO. Okay. Okay. I didn't know why it was like, I, I don't want to get, you know, too comfortable here with first names, but anyway. Um, so we had Grace, I was uh, leading those meetings, and then we had all of the principals and our director of curriculum and instruction. We also invited our parents who had run for election, Scott has served, we had two other parents from um, ACES, or no, I lied, um, I misspoke, excuse me, uh, from TAS and from WAS. And they were with us as well, giving us ideas about what parent volunteerism could be like, the role they would like to play as board members, and the idea of the school as a whole came up, and they wholeheartedly supported it, this particular um, group. So you can see here a description. It is to recognize the issues that go across all three of our schools that affect us as a district, if you will, and the representative roles of the parents would have really a lot of meaning because they would be responsible for supporting the um, planning for and the communication out to their individual school parent population to bring them to the school as a whole. One of the things that became really quite apparent was that the topics that we wanted to have came up during the LCAP. And so we would be responding directly to the parents and the issues that they, um, that they highly found important in terms of the LCAP and the survey that they took. So we're really interested in expanding parent engagement. We want to make certain that our teachers um, are connected to the parents in multiple ways, and so the school as a whole is a different um, mechanism. And there, we currently have tentatively four per year, 
The first one is going to be in September, and it's going to be the day before our call-in board meeting. And one of the things that is on the agenda is for me to talk about what the board role is in supporting the accelerated schools, and in particular, the two board goals that we have this year, so that our parents really know and understand the work that we're engaged in, and that we are aligned as a board with our leadership and with our administration and with our faculty. So that's really the meaning of the uh, SAW. And we would have, uh, right now, keeping my fingers crossed, we're going to be floating a position for the parent and community liaison. And that person would be a full-time position that would work to support parent workshops, as well as our parent board representatives when they prepare for the school advisory. Um, excuse me, the school as a whole. So this is just information because this is a management decision, so it isn't a board requirement. But we wanted to make certain that the board knew, and I'm inviting all of the board to come with me um, on September 25th, and I believe the meeting is at 8.30 in the morning. Just so you know. Okay. Any questions or um, discussion about the school as a whole? actually pretty excited about it, to tell you the truth. Um, okay, and then the last thing we have is a parent advisory committee. Now, when we have parents on the board, we do like for them to be involved in a committee. Uh, so far, our committees have not really been as energized, although that's one of my goals, personal board goals, to get our committees energized. And one of the things that we thought would be very important is for our parent representatives who are duly elected, having gone through a screening of their school and our board uh, nomination committee, would come together as a formally recognized committee of the board, which would mean that they would be responsible for following the Brown Act. 72, with they have to come up with an agenda, the agenda needs to go out and be publicized, minutes need to be taken, and then reported back at the following meeting. We're very interested in this being a formal committee of the board, first of all, because we didn't want this to be a group of parents who were just complaining. We wanted it to be a group of parents who were seeking to take issues that the parents bring, both in the individual schools, but also across all three schools, so that it was an organized meeting and it fed into the board as a whole. So um, this is an action item. It doesn't say that on the back. But this is an action item, and we would like um, some discussion and questions about this. Parent advisory committee members would also be board members. Is that what you're saying? They would be board members, and therefore they would be on this committee. They would be appointed to that committee so, as board members. And you're thinking that the, the parent board members would be the logical choice? To start out the committee, we could have other, like for instance, I'm planning on being on that committee myself, because part of it was my idea. So I thought I would just you know, stand in front and uh, lead rather than stand in back and push. But yeah, I believe other board members could certainly be a part of, of the uh, that particular committee. I like the formality of it because it puts some constraints, but it also gives that it gives a huge opportunity for voicing a lot of these kinds of issues, but in a formal um, protocol sort of way. Right, and one of the uh, one of the attributes of this particular proposal is that there would be a time on each board agenda 
for the Parent Advisory Committee to report to the board and to the public about what the issues are. And the, the community and parent liaison would be a part of those meetings, but not, obviously not a formal part of the board, but a part of the meetings and... Right, right. Because the parent community liaison, in, in our mind, in the committee's mind that worked on this to put it together, was that it goes beyond the parent advisory committee to parent workshops, um, reaching out to the community in other ways, planning uh, cleanup events, um, working with the school leadership, so that the school leadership wasn't planning individual things all along, but that this parent and community liaison was really responsible for outreach to the community, bringing the community in, and um, sharing issues with our board. Mm -hmm. But the parent um, community liaison would have a very active role in that. We took the model actually from um, the 21st Century Learning Center where Yvonne Chan is the principal and has been the principal for 25 years. I went out and spent the day with uh, their particular uh, community member and came back with just incredible um, ideas about how to form partnerships with community groups as well as to have different kinds of workshops for parents and to bring the schools into that and the faculties into that. One of the things they had which was really fascinating was they had two monthly parent meetings with different topics that the parents had identified and each grade level throughout the year was responsible for one of these meetings and they provided um, child care and they provided very minimum but interesting little um, cookies and coffee kind of thing and so each grade level now I'm not saying that's going to happen but it was a one of those ideas that really resonated with me that brought the faculty in to more connection with the parents and with meeting the kids. So I thought it was a good idea. Any any other questions or comments? Uh, just a comment. Julie, I just want to say thank you so much for all your effort you put into this. I think it's super significant that um, that these things are happening and just as a parent, really grateful for the effort you put into it. Thanks, and I want to thank the committee um, as I mentioned, that was all of our principals, uh, director of curriculum instruction, and our CEO. So this was a large group that met four or five, well actually I think we met five times, to put this together and to really flesh this out. Okay. So, can I get a motion? Okay. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. <sighs> I'm a happy girl. <laughs> okay, you've, you've um, made my year because I'm so interested in really getting connected with our parent community in, in a very different way. And it's a great day. And iterating, yeah. We've got to come, we can't just have a block. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's important. Right, and we will take all suggestions and love to have you all involved in whatever way you can. Okay, so update on collaborative consensus committee. Okay, this was another one <laughs> of those interesting ideas that has blossomed and very, very excited. I can't even remember how many meetings we've had. How many have we had? We eight. met about eight. Eight? Mm -hmm. Is that counting the? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we met two days in a row in the afternoon after um, our, our teachers were um, out of summer school and the principals were with us. And we started out with our union representatives. And Carrie um, took another job, and she's not our union representative, so she was um, followed on that committee by... But anyway, we had, we had teachers from each of the schools, we had administrators from each of the school, and uh, Grace and I were there. And we did investigation 
from other districts and other charter schools, as well as from John's organization, on what their evaluations were like. And the purpose of the C3 committee, which is the, the collaborative consensus committee, came out of the negotiations. And there was a side letter signed that this, in fact, was going to be one of the committees that the school was going to support. And the first piece of business was to relook at and change the way teachers are evaluated. Because the second part of this was we wanted to develop multi-year criteria for contract, um, for offering multi-year contracts. And it was impossible for teachers to reach the, that level of exceeds in everything um, as, across all of the different uh, California standards for the teaching profession. Therefore, we have finished, as a group, a pilot that shifts the emphasis from catching you doing something wrong to catching you doing something right and really thinking about growth. Because anyone we hire, we want to keep, and we want them to grow. So we have a pilot that's starting this year Within, with the evaluation, we have, we have a vision from our CEO. We have how this relates to what used to be, as well as where we're headed and the direction we're headed, which is growth, support, and helping people become better educators. And um, we have the forms that were developed by the group. We have rubrics that are specific to those forms and what we're going to be observing. And one of the most exciting parts is that the teachers in this particular C3 committee have requested the opportunity to have a peer work with them and to give them feedback. So that is part of the pilot. So they will be, if, I don't, I don't like the word evaluate. Their performance will be assessed, let me just put it that way, um, by a number of people. It won't just be the administrator. It will be um, this peer that is selected, and then it will also be potentially the coaches, the counselors, and other administrative managers. So it's a little bit larger group of people who are really going to be giving different perspectives. The other thing that we thought was really interesting, and we'll see how this works out, because it is a pilot, but the first set of visits are going to focus on, <coughs> I wish I could remember the things that they were going to focus on. Uh, competencies related to classroom management <coughs> instruction. Right, beginning of the school year. Classroom management, you know that's a big, big deal, especially for some of our new teachers. And then the second group of visits will be Teaching, instruction, and assessment. Okay, so that's when the getting ready for the, the testing goes, our own individual testing. And then the final set of, of uh, visits will be professional <laughs> accountabilities and quality of student learning. Right. <laughs> okay, so. So this should be the four seasons because. <laughs> is, it a, is it an outgrowth of our cheesecake factory? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yes, actually it is. I mean, you were in the room when this topic so, came up. Yeah, I was actually going to say, I don't want to wait three years. Uh, no, no, it's starting. Meeting with him, and it's just we meet again at, at the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> what's going on? But, it, but I don't think we need to do that. Those people, do you think they're satisfied that we are actually following through some of the uh, not that we're just following through with some of them. They are actively involved in helping create the new evaluation. It's co-created. So those Cheesecake Factory teachers. Right. Are, are we confident that they're happy? With the yes, we are. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Amber is still on the committee. Mm -hmm. We've had two other teachers fill in for people who have left the leadership position, the union position. And they're very excited. I mean, believe me, this was a consensus committee. It wasn't voting. It yeah, was. Still, would be productive to take them to lunch again and have to come those. I accept on their behalf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay. I mean, it was just, it's really been quite exciting and very fulfilling. And Grace has led this group incredibly well. Uh, she's really made strides in helping us get materials, take a look, giving us prompts, having us do homework, and coming back and being ready to talk and ready to make decisions about this. So I really want to thank you very, very much. And to all of our principals who've, um, who've been on this committee as So well. the core group would be six teachers in my hearing? No, well, if, if you want to bring back the two teachers, right. well, one of them has um, moved on. Yeah. Um, Carrie is still with us, but right. she is a different position. And so we have the two teachers that were on there, as well as Amber, so that's the third teacher, and then our, our principals and Grace and Lisa. And they, they do their peers that they picked? Yeah. We, well, we'll see. Let's talk about that. Let's okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah. But it'd be really, casual. it would be really fun to, to do that, and uh, we're going to make that Can work. Can we get a report on um, what the retention was? Or is that going to happen today? Yes. Yeah, that's right. happening. Okay. Yes. You'll hear. Yeah. Retention, but the no, fire. Okay. Oh, okay. And then um, update on external partners. We had a very, very successful uh, year last year with Brent Klein, who um, worked with USC and with uh, Tara Goodman on My Voice Matters. And what happened during that particular partnership? Tara invited stars from LAFC to come in and be interviewed by students. And this was a history social science class. So it's not just about English literacy. It's about their voice matters and how they can write about things. So they interviewed uh, these stars and wrote about different things and then presented their essays to the other people, um, other students. During the summer, we had a very successful summer school program where Lenox Middle School students and our middle school students who had been involved in the program came together for summer school. And we had um, a consultant come down from Oregon that started the, uh, the uh, journalistic literacy um, program initially that now is called My Voice Matters. And she worked very diligently with these students and with the teachers to help them understand how to help kids write and get their voice out there. They were each given uh, composition books, and they wrote about all of the interviews that they did. And then we had a very successful parent and student meeting at LAFC in their, I don't know what you would call it. It's a it's loud. Their uh, restaurant, I guess you would call it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Inter entertainment center, you know, where they have the pinball machines and everything. But it was really fabulous. We had all of our parents show up, all of the kids showed up, and Tara was there and handed out LAFC scarves you know, and all of that. So we are continuing that. Brent is continuing to do that in the middle school. And I've encouraged um, Francis to explore other teachers, maybe popping in when that My Voice Matters is going on to see if it might, you know, charge, charge them up a little bit. The other uh, partnerships are just beginning, and Elizabeth and I are working on this. Uh, USC, which has always had a family of five, which included the Fauché Learning Center and 32nd Street School, but never the accelerated school, is now reaching out to us. And they're reaching out to us on matters of STEM. They have in Dornsife, which is um, a group that they have there. There are experiential learning opportunities. There are STEM opportunities. There are other opportunities for students at USC to come and be a part of our classrooms. And so we, what we wanted to do with the direction from Grace was we don't want this to look like a Christmas tree where we've got My Voice Matters here on this branch and we've got the stem over here on this branch but another stem on this branch. We want it to be a coherent and consistent program where all partners see their role and see everyone else's role. 
One of the things that we're really looking forward to is having USC students on our campus. But we don't want them just coming willy-nilly and, oh, by the way, you're going to be in this teacher's classroom and this teacher's classroom. We want it to be really thought out, we want it to be formal, and we want it to be successful. So we have a meeting set up for September 27th with a number of our partners from Dornside, and we're going to start the conversation about what the um, available opportunities are and how they might work here at the Accelerated School. We're hoping to get Grace a bit of time so that she can <laughs> join us. All right, good deal. And um, that's really exciting where that goes. Now in terms of other partnerships, our foundation has met and we are looking at a parenting community center and hopefully that space will be available. I don't know. Do we have, do we have that space available? Is that going to be available? In discussions. In discussions. Okay. So we have an ide we've identified an area we'd like for the parenting community um, committee and uh, the liaison group to be housed. Once we do that, then I believe the foundation will be able to go to some of our potential funders and say, this is what we've got going, how can you help us? Okay? So I think that's it for my long-winded president's report. Okay? Okay. There we go. Any, any, comments, any comments or anything else? Very excited. Okay, good deal. Nice to see you as Yes, yes, and they're they're really um, they're really reaching out to us. It's really cool. Can I speak yeah, go just for a second. Yeah, I'll please. elaborate on that. Um, you know, the precedent. I mean, I did go outside the family of five, and this was ten years you ago. You did I partnered with Susan you Rogers. Were rebel you. And <laughs> I did. I, I broke new ground and and came over here, and and my students have been coming here and making a real difference for years, probably about a decade. So this is why, one of the reasons why we can now accept this kind of, oh my gosh, we're going to now expand, you know, to do this. But it also gives us an opportunity to replicate, you know, to look up at, look at this model and say all we have to do is replicate it. It's already been sort of experimented with. Do you see what I mean? And we can examine it and tweak it, whatever we want to do with it. But, but really, the pattern is established. So instead of having to read that video, we're going to Good point. Good point. OK, any, any other? OK, moving right along. Yes, it'd be you. Do the board members need a little stretch break, about five minutes? Sure. You've been sitting for about an hour. Yeah. Come back at 11.15. Thanks. Okay. Hi. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Grace, the CEO. Nice to meet you. Thank you. 
I'm Julie Quinn, I'm the board president, and you are a member of the community. Okay, you're not saying, okay, thank you. Okay, I think we're ready. Mom,
we're going to be sharing with you where are we now, and we would like to engage you in it. This is where we are now, and 100% is our end goal. Where do you see us going next? So the first success criteria that we would like to introduce is the early literacy measure of all students who are with us. When they enter our schools, and if they're entering our schools, that they should be reading at grade level by second grade. And Susan's going to elaborate more on why second grade reading lifestyle level is an important indicator. And she's going to be sharing with us data on where we are right now. We'd like the board members to think about, and we're going to discuss afterwards, is this the right metric? And where should we go next? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam President, board members. Good to see you. Um, I'm very excited about doing this because it's uh, measuring across all of the grade levels and early literacy is a passion of mine. When I was in education, I was a literacy coach and a content expert and so it's a huge part of what we want for our students to be able to accomplish. So um, as it says here, we want 100% of our students who have entered our school, they've entered in kindergarten, by second grade we want them to be able um, to be reading at grade level. So why is early literacy important? It, it just It's the basic foundation for students to be successful, for them to be able to graduate from high school, um, reduction in special education referrals, um, kids that cannot read sometimes uh, are at risk for different behaviors and acting out in the classroom. Um, and it's also, it's more affordable because if you can address any type of reading difficulties that kids have early on, um, it's going to take less time to address it. So the question is, okay, how are we doing that? We want them to be successful in life. So let's look at uh, some of our early literacy data. We are still working on having a system and a process for gathering data that is common across um, both of the school sites. This is what we have currently. So if we look at uh, ACES and TAS for 2018, um, we have been working with uh, learning ovations, or A2I, which, uh, which is assessment to instruction. Um, it's an assessment that last year we began with kindergarten and first grade at both, both TAS and ACES to measure growth for children. And it's looking um, not only on their ability to decode um, reading or the words, but it's also looking at uh, meaning and their vocabulary. And we know because of the community that we work in, many of our students come in and they are months below. So this assessment actually, vocabulary-wise, will measure, uh, for example, if a child is entering kindergarten, it will say that they are, their vocabulary is maybe um, that of a three and a half year old in English, for example. So teachers are having to work very hard, administrators are having to work very hard in order to provide those type of enriching experiences for the kids to build up that vocabulary. Um, so this is the data from last year. I did check in with them because I was saying, well, I'm looking that maybe some of it goes down a little bit. Um, this is a long-term process. It's all the way from kindergarten to third grade. So it's not like, oh, by the end of kinder, we're going to have 100% of our kids. It's a process that the kids have to go kinder through third grade with the A2I. Um, the assessment to instruction also comes with a coach that comes to the school sites to work with the teachers. It's based around differentiated uh, small group instruction, student-centered, um, and it's part of MTSS and the Tier 1, so we're also walk, uh, working with Dr. Baines around that. So this is effective, um, I'm going to use Bobby's term, high leverage uh, instruction that needs to go on in the classrooms to get our students to these high reading levels. Um, one of the good things in uh, speaking with the person that we're working with with data is that our students this year in first grade are starting out four months ahead of where they were last year. So that's, that's good to see that. And as they uh, continue to grow up into third grade, um, the reading scores uh, will get better with that. Um, I also inquired about 
what is the difference, for example, in schools uh, where there is high, uh, high SES, um, children uh, that are on, you know, at proficient or above, it's about 65 to 70 percent of students. If we're not in this particular community, but in another community, 65 to 70 percent will be at grade level reading if the teacher is implementing small group differentiated instruction for the students. The difference with our instruction is we have um, two additional things. We have the assessment to instruction, which is an algorithm that provides information to teachers about how many minutes to spend on particular uh, skill set that the children need. So that if uh, child number one is already reading at a first grade level, we want them to continue their growth. So I'm going to give this student something different than I would give another student that is still not at grade level. And so it's differentiated, it's going to help those that are struggling, it's also going to continue to grow those um, that are higher. And, oh, and with the A2I and having the coach in this particular program, it increases from 65 to 70 percent to 94 percent, as high as 94 94 percent of students reading at grade level regardless of SES, which is huge for our school community. So, and you do it in the in this. the glossary you have SES? <laughs> uh, socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged, and the, the terminology changes over there, but you know, any students coming from high poverty, for right. simple language. Students coming from high poverty, but regardless of the background um, with this particular uh, implementation of teaching kids to read, regardless of their poverty level or their background, um, they have success as high as 94%, which is, which is good news and important for, for our school community. So CEO and staff presenting our first success criteria on accelerating student learning, that would be 100% of our students who have entered our schools since kindergarten will be reading at grade level by second grade. We'd like to hear from the board. Is this a measure? Where do we need to go next if this is our measure given the data that Susan provided and where we want to be ultimately at 100%? Okay, so I just some clarification. At grade level by second grade. Are you talking about the end of second grade in prep for third? Yes. Okay, thanks. What is the, is there a standard out there that works that's kind of typical for us, say LAUSD? Susan, would you like to address that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I, truthfully, I don't know if that's a great thing or if our kids that achieve that are still behind the general population. If the students that achieve, if by, students, by the end of second grade are, are reading at second grade level, is that a good thing or? Yes, absolutely. Well, um, it, 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 it sounds like that, but what's, what are the statistics for students at large? Can I put it a little differently? Okay, yes. Can I translate Leonard, I think? Please. <laughs> so, um, the goal sounds great. I think, I think what Leonard's trying to figure out and what I'm, I'd like to know as well, is that uh, an aggressive goal, yeah. or medium, medium goal, or, or, a, or, a, or a conservative goal? Aggressive, okay. extremely aggressive. That, that was a question. Yeah, 100%. Uh, listen, I, so, so, hey, Larry, look, I, I, assume, listen, I assume it's an aggressive goal. I just think our goal should be aggressive. So we want to be delivering the highest quality education to all our students. So. I think we should want to confirm that as a board that we are staying aggressive in our goals. So. That's why the little guy on our logo is going like this. Right. Maybe not. Uh, We're staying not accelerated. Exactly. Yeah. What percent is really accelerated? Because why would, we, why would we ever set a standard that we assume not all of our children would well, sure. I think yeah. that's right. So I think we have right. to have 100%. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Where does that standard come from? 100%? No, the <laughs> second grade level. Second it's grade going level. back that if children generally uh, people use third grade. Yeah, if children grade. cannot read by third grade, um, there's so many, there's so much different information about students, you know, about uh, prison population. 50% of students that are uh, incarcerated are non-readers. Um, they struggle with reading. So this is, this is a huge 
um, skill that students need to have in order to be successful generally. Just, but who sets the standard for grade level two? What's weird is Well, part of it is you're is learning that? to is read. That? You're kind of learning. No, I, I understand oh. that, but it sounds like there's some metric out there yeah, that would say. Ah, what, what assessment are you using? Right now, we're using the HUI assessment to instruction. And they, um, and they have using, research that backs up that this is. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Maybe at another meeting. So, I assessment to instruction is some published. It's through the University of Irvine. Okay. Um, and Dr. Connor is working with learning innovations. Um, along with this assessment, and she came up with, not her, but they came up with an algorithm to determine the minutes that children need in order to be successful. I know it came out of the state of uh, Florida is where they did their research. So it is the only evidence-based research to uh, support literacy. So there's some standard out there that, that you're comfortable <coughs> that is acceptable it's to apply. And then yes. how do we know at the end of second grade that it's given a test, or how do you know that they... Yes, this assessment is given throughout the school year. It, it, it can be done every six, as often as every six weeks. I'm looking at the HY website. The I, would, I, would, I would summarize what I think happens is HY includes an assessment of, of literacy that just agreed upon general standards of what children should be able to know and don't be able to do and what assessment means when they're in third grade. And, and there's a lot of evidence that if they can read at third grade, they're going to be much more successful than if they can't. So, so the standard makes total sense. HY is one way to assess that. Well, I didn't know about it before today, so I can't tell you I think it's the best thing in the world or not. Right. But it also then comes with a whole set of tools for the school yeah. to, to assess children to help develop programs to make sure that children at different levels of getting the literacy get the help they need and, and work with teachers, I assume, th through your office to, yeah. to, to, to make sure that the teachers know how, how, to, how to assess the challenges children have and help get them there. And, and whatever happens when you implement this, we will have 100% literacy next year. It, it takes longer than that for the teachers yeah. to know how to do it, for right. students to get comfortable with it um, and, and to be there. But, but the trick would be to, to see um, even larger numbers of, of students who are reading grade level. I, I thought your numbers um, looked reasonably high for a school in, 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 in this area, uh, so, so that they're starting from a good place. And, and, and it sort of seems like it fits in, as I read this very, very quickly, yeah. with the concepts around the accelerated school, yeah. which yeah. I'm a little more familiar with. So, so it feels like, uh, I mean, you've obviously thought about it, picked one that's going to work for you. I would yeah. ever think to second guess that, I promise. Uh, but this one looks like it makes sense to me. And please excuse my ignorance, but I'm just looking at it, and it's a paragraph, and it looks great, but I wanted to no, drill, and I I wanted to drill down a little bit and questions. know how it's, how, where it came from, right. how it's applied, and how we know when we get there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments from our board members on this first metric that all students in our schools at Accelerated should be reading at grade level by second grade? Can I just ask one yes. question about it? Um, I, I like the measure a lot. What, it, what does that mean for students that didn't start in kindergarten? And what percent of our kids get through second grade and didn't start with us at kindergarten? That's a really good question. And it's actually, we have a very high retention rate at the lower grades. So for example, Susan has almost 100% at ACES of our students matriculating to the other grade levels. Um, that, would some, that would be something to think about as we start drilling down to, cascading down this to all levels of the organization and different subgroups. But at first blush, we felt very comfortable to say that this is our promise to our kids in our community, that if you're starting with us at second for kindergarten, that you'll be reading at grade level by second. And what do we do with students that are significantly deficient in that goal by the time they're in second grade? Do we push them forward anyway? Or do yeah. we so there are parts of the program that are that we call intervention. So they, they would be given additional instruction in minutes so that they are meeting the goal. So first it's the goal. Where is the student towards the goal and how are we closing that gap? That gap analysis. Yes. And our special education students, are they going to be held to that same standard? Well, that's another layer that we need to start thinking about, about the different subgroups and the different students. Okay. Because I want to make certain that if students need accommodation or special circumstances, um, that that is absolutely addressed. So I know Dr. Baines is on that one. Okay. Thank you. The next 
level that we want to present is actually a success criteria that's called a growth measure. So the first one was an early literacy measure, and then the next one is a growth measure. And this one, even though you see that 100% of our students will grow one year in one year's time, this is actually probably the most aggressive goal that we're going to present to you in all of our core. Because what we know about organizations is that even though students grow, there are very few learning organizations where students do not grow, where they're receding in their learning. However, the question becomes, how much are they growing? And so the best learning organizations are able to achieve that blue line or that green line, and that blue line being one year's growth in one year's time. Now, a lot of organizations, learning organizations, they are growing their students, but they're growing at what you see is the dotted line, the lowest line, which is a less than one year's growth at one year's time. So with the whole notion of what does accelerated mean, is this an aggressive goal, we want the best outcome for our kids, our next success criteria that we would like to present to you is that all students in our organization are learning one year's growth in one year's time, and there's going to be some metric that we introduce to that, which is minimum of 50 scale score points in ELA and math. Bobby, we're going to introduce Bobby and ask him to come up. He's going to share some more details about why this should be the goal in our organization and linking the tie between one year's growth and one year's time to 50 scale score points. So to give you some context on this emphasis on growth, as opposed to the traditional metric of achievement, I want to give you a sense of where this fits into the big picture, not only in terms of what we're trying to achieve for our students, but also in terms of how we're being measured and assessed by outside organizations. So LAUSD is rolling out a new school performance framework this year that will be applied to all LA Unified schools and all charter schools that are overseen by LA Unified. It will look significantly different to the public than what the public is used to seeing when they look at our data over the past several years. You see here an example of a five-star system that simply rates all schools, both LAUSD and LAUSD overseen charters, as a one-star school, a two-star school, and so on, up to five stars. It makes it very simple for the public to make a value judgment about whether or not this is a good school, or whether or not one school is a better school than another one. The downside to this is that it removes all the complexity out of this, and allows for the public to simply look at that five-star rating without considering all the factors that feed into that and knowing that different parents might be more interested in seeing our performance on certain metrics within that than that overarching goal. The bottom line, though, is that by this spring, every one of our schools, along with every other public school in Los Angeles, will have a five-star rating published on a public website. Now, I want to expose you, and this is just a beginning conversation around this, there are obviously much longer conversations to be had. But these are the metrics that will feed into that five-star rating that we will receive for each one of our schools. For elementary and middle schools, 45% of that rating will be based on growth. 35% will be based on achievement. And 20% will be based on school climate. I'll pause for a minute to give you a second to take a look at all of the different metrics that are used to determine those factors and ask any questions that you might have about that. SBA is the smarter balance? This, yes. yes. Okay. I want to particularly emphasize the difference between growth and achievement. And that when we talk about achievement, we are holding all students to the same standard. We are simply saying, how high did you score on a particular test? And we are not considering the starting point of that student. 
growth considers the starting point of that student. And so a growth metric actually gives us a much more accurate picture of how we as a school are performing in relation to other schools that may have very different populations in their system. So for example, a school where all students are entering already reading at or above grade level, where all students are entering with various types of privilege and advantage, their achievement scores might look higher, higher than ours, but they're not achieving growth. Knowing that we are intentionally serving students that often do not have the type of privilege that other systems might, might have built into the community, we want to emphasize on how we're helping them grow toward achievement. I'm clicking ahead now to the same information but for high schools. You'll notice here the numbers are adjusted slightly to accommodate for the addition of the last column, college and career readiness. And I'll pause again here for you to process this information. Any questions on the high school metrics? Yes, please. Um. AP pass rate. Do we have enough AP classes in order for us to even be eligible in that particular category? We do. That is a complex that's factor to consider in terms of the reputation of the school. Right. Because there are metrics out there that emphasize AP enrollment rate. Because there's quite a bit of research indicating that simply enrolling in an AP course provides long-term educational benefit to students. And so schools like ours have traditionally emphasized getting as many students as possible, even those who might not meet traditional prerequisites for entering an AP course, into those courses to expose them to college level really, truly rigorous instruction, knowing that even if they don't pass that assessment at the end of the year, they're going to get long-term benefits. This metric, though, focusing on pass rate, ultimately will discourage schools from enrolling students who may be less prepared for those classes in those courses. So again, there are many, many very long, very in-depth discussions to be had about these metrics and how we respond to them. But this is simply what we have, and this is the information that's going to feed into this particular indicator. Okay, um, give us just a snippet on early assessment program and, and why that's part of this particular metric. Sure. Um, and just to be perfectly clear on why these are part of these metric measures, this was adopted by the LAUSD school board, and so they've had those discussions on that. So all I can say is my understanding of their thinking around that. So that EAP is essentially a college preparedness test that's there to determine the extent to which our graduates are prepared to go into on grade level courses at universities. That's what I was looking for. Yes. Thanks. So I want to emphasize the key takeaway here, which is that the largest factor in LAUSD school performance framework is growth. This is why our CEO has proposed this goal that focuses on growth, where every student will grow a minimum of 50 scale score points on the cast in both math and ELA. I also want to share with you out where we are currently. So you see in front of you the ELA and math data for ACES. Hello? And I'll click ahead to the ELA and math data for TAS. Of the students are seeing positive growth, but not up to that 50. Is that what we're talking about? Exactly. So positive, positive growth, but less growth than is, is, is expected in one year's time. Okay. Less than 50 schools. Yeah. Exactly. And from what I understand, supposedly, supposedly out of the ether, every kid who's in school should grow one year without anything special happening. 
Generally, without anything special happening, students tend to experience significantly less than one year growth. Okay, so, so it takes what I think you could colloquially call colloquially colloquially. Why can't I say that word? <laughs> you just did. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> An average quality education to generate one year growth if all other factors are equal as right. well. Right. Keeping in mind that there are tons of external factors that also influence growth, including community factors, family factors, socioeconomic factors, and so on. But if you combine all things together across all communities, you could simply say an average quality education is going to generate one year's growth in one year's time. The reason this is such an aggressive goal for us and not an average goal for us is because our students, for the most part, face disadvantages that typically prevent them from achieving one year's growth in one year's time. And so it's actually a very aggressive goal for us to simply get to that point, especially when we're talking about 100% of our students across all seven groups. Thank you. I also want to be clear about why we are not including WAS data in this at this time, although we are also looking at that data. High school growth data is much more complex to track, especially when you're using the CASP as a metric, because the CASP is administered only in 11th grade at the high school level. We don't give that test in 9th or 10th grade. That would be the California Assessment of Academic Performance? Absolutely, which is the same thing as the SBAC. It's just California's version of the SBAC. Okay. So when I use the term CAS, and when I use the term SBAC, we're saying the and same thing. <laughs> but because we as a state only offer that assessment in 11th grade, we can't use that assessment to track year-to-year -year data. And so we're looking at various metrics that we can use on a shorter time frame to get that formative data and track growth from year to year, in that growth metric to determine that five-star rating, what they're going to be looking at is growth from eighth grade up through 11th grade. So that data actually doesn't become terribly actionable for us in any way because there are so many factors that happen between the end of eighth grade to the end of 11th grade. But that's something that we are thinking deeply about as an organization is how do we generate actionable formative data through the course of high school in order to really see how we're doing on this metric. So that it's not just simply we assess them in eighth grade and then we're going to do our best for three years and be surprised at the results. We don't want any surprises when that comes along. Any other questions on this piece? Is there anything else you'd like for me to address while I'm here? No, we can go to the next slide. So if there are no clarifications, what we're presenting as the second goal is if all of our students have entered in kindergarten and they're leaving at grade level, then our next expectation as an organization, what we're striving to achieve as a very aggressive way is that every student is making that year's growth. So that turns into 100% of our students will grow a minimum of 50 skills or points in ELA and math by the end of that academic year. How do you hold yourself accountable for a child who joins this, this, this system in the school state in the sixth grade and is four grade levels below sixth grade? Um, if they achieve a grade a year, they still want to end up at the end of fourth grade with an eighth grade yeah. So you make your goal, is that is, how do you address that in this process? Or in the I don't, I'm just going to go on. And I, I, I'm savvy enough to know, Larry, that's the question that you want us to think about and not answer right now. That's why I would Because it's a very hard problem, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you have to come below the grade level, right. and you get them up to grade level, you've succeeded. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you met that goal, mm -hmm. but at the end of the six years they were here, mm -hmm. they're still four levels behind where they should have been. Mm -hmm. Through no fault of your own, if you will, because that's where they arrived. So, so those challenges always, always come in, and you have to... This measure would be, be accepted, you get it, okay, but it's, it's, it's a challenge. They're also going to be harder to get grade level growth if they have these challenges like that. Mm -hmm. so there's just other things, factors that affect their interest in school. And, 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 It'd be interesting to see how this goes. This, that's a, this is a great goal. I mean, you could just like throw a roadblock in front of you the very first second. That was, that was probably unreasonable. But it was curious. It's a speed bump, not a roadblock. 
it's it's a it's a hard hard question. Yeah, um, absolutely. What in terms of diagnostics? If you raise a child in eleventh grade at the third grade level, mm -hmm. you should give us enough money to complement all those years that you gain any learning. Well, um, if you're spending ten thousand a year per child, we should get ten thousand dollars times ten years, hundred thousand dollars to get them out of high school. Wow. Nobody's ever done that, of course. But there's there's and that's you know. Somewhat of a thinking for Taylor one There you go. Well, or or um, thinking about how you get this system, but, but I don't think this is a good generate those kinds of resources that we can model. Any other comments or feedback from our board members regarding board members' success criteria number two? So if I were to qualify any of it, I would say this is probably the newest to our organization because we're te te we're te we're used <laughs> Bobby, you gave it to me now. <laughs> We're used to having discussions on achievement, about college and career readiness, and where where are they going, and how are they doing afterwards. This is probably the biggest, hairiest, most audacious goal for us. And then also transforming our learning organization in far away um, international organizations that are doing well. We're doing this. Now what's interesting to note is we don't like to use averages, but on average, are we accelerating our students? Absolutely, but our average tends to be just right below that one year's growth and one year's time. So by the time that they're in ninth and 10th grade, now all those factors are catching up with that. The next one is success criteria number three, that you're most familiar with, and this is our end goal. This is our achievement goal, because this is now the end of the pipeline at our high school. And this one, we would like to introduce two new terms to you. The first one is that 100% of our students will graduate, and this is a number that's going to resonate with us within four years as a cohort. And you're going to hear why that four years is really important. Second, that they're going to gra graduate college and career ready. So this brings me back to Elizabeth's comment and Vinti's comment about how are they doing afterwards, Leonard? college persistence and how are they doing afterwards. This achievement measure is going to handle both, and we're going to first hear from Ms. Lenita Lugo on why do we have a four-year cohort graduation rate and where are we now. Thank you, Grace. Good morning, everyone. If you could think back to April <laughs> when our wonderful IT director, Kong Liu, gave a presentation on graduation rate versus cohort rate. We're all still kind of understanding that information. So this is where we are now um, at Wallace Annenberg High School. This is 2018, so this was actually two years ago. I'll show you the next slide that has last year's data. The graduation rate for spring 2018 for our seniors that graduated is 96%. However, our cohort graduation rate, which is now what the California dashboard is, being, is asking us to look at, is 79.3%. We all kind of understand the difference between the two. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to pass Start. this next slide because I have this on here just in case we needed to revisit it. Last year, spring 2019, we had 104 students that that graduated, and that gives us a graduation rate of 95%. However, we do not have a cohort graduation rate currently because the CDE doesn't release that data until December, January, or something like that. So we'll be able to bring this back to you when we have that information available. What have, I don't, am I interrupting your presentation? This is a perfect time. Okay, um, so I'm wondering, um, I'll think of it again, just a minute. Go ahead. Now I'm going to bring Rosie up, and she is going to take us to where we are now versus being college and career ready. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, like we had talked about, um, what was mentioned earlier before, um, what's college career readiness? It, is, it does include um, a lot of different factors now. It's not just a high school graduation. So right now, um, in at Wallace and Hamburg in 2017, 50.9% uh, of students were college ready. And in 2018, it was 53%. So there is incremental growth. So our goal is to provide the incremental growth for our students as well. Um, so the work that we're doing at um, Wallace and Hamburg is, this is what we're identifying as, um, in a California dashboard, where is college career readiness. And, and we talked about this last time as well. So we're actually just looking at what was considered prepared, and I'm letting you know in terms of what are some things 
um, that we're doing at Wallace and at Bird to ensure that our students are prepared. So in terms of SPEC scores, we're working with our English teachers and math teachers to ensure that um, not only um, they're addressing the core standards in the classroom, but we're also doing a formative assessment with the students to provide them opportunities to have exposure to uh, item types, but also the platform for the assessment. And we're also um, AP exams. Uh, we had um, uh, our AP exam, we're increasing the number of AP classes, and we're providing um, support for our AP teachers, training for them to actually uh, be more successful in terms of administering or um, teaching those AP classes. And then also dual enrollment, we're continuing on with the dual enrollment classes and getting a lot of support and traction with um, LATC in terms of providing those opportunities for their teachers to come on campus. And then also, um, any students who come into our school, our track is at minimum the ADG requirements. So when the students come in, they know we already have, um, we have student assemblies right now. We're talking about their ADG requirements. All students are coming in and their expectation is at minimum they're taking courses that meet the ATG requirement. Um, so those are also um, the additional criteria. So I'm just going to give you a minute to look at that. But those are all the things that we're actually doing at Wallace Sandberg High School in terms of preparing our students um, to be college career ready. I remembered what I was going to ask. Okay, with cohort, that means entering ninth graders mm -hmm. graduate after four years. Mm -hmm. So what happens to our students who transfer or we don't follow them. I mean, how do those end up counting? So the number, the number that we end ninth grade with. For example, if we if we had 100 students come in at the beginning of ninth grade, and then at the end of ninth grade there were 80 students. That is our cohort number. So that's the number that we have to have graduate at the end of 12th grade. But what if they transfer in in 11th grade? Then we need to get another kid in to to take that student's place to maintain our cohort number. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right. Yes, that was my question. Um, and then, is there a difference between the UC and CSU um, eligibility requirements? Um, just in terms of this, uh, the courses, um, but in terms of this basic requirements. Yeah. Well, I know, but in terms of the courses, so the CSU, you only have to take three years of math, right? Not four? And then uh, English. Okay. Okay, I just want to be clear that while they're both college eligible, they're not at the same criteria. Okay. Wow. So in the previous slide, we had, um, and I'm going to use the word only advisedly, okay, only 53.4% of students were prepared, but we graduated everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So. And we had a lot of students, so if they went to a community college, they wouldn't have been identified as college prepared. Is that right? Well, well also, are we looking at, at personal grade levels or just the graduating class? Graduating class. I'm not sure about that. So of all, this, of all the students who graduated, okay. in order for them to be prepared, they have to meet these criteria. So they oh. meeting these criteria, so for any student that graduated, they met maybe pick one student. That student had a um, score of three in ELA and math. So that's one person that's prepared. Another student, maybe the other student took advanced placement. So um, that person scored a three or higher in two AP exams. So what we want to do is, talk about earlier, leveraging the best outcome for your students. We're wanting to um, ensure that all our students are have the opportunity to score a three in, or higher, or four, in ELA and math. And if that doesn't happen, then what are we doing in terms of advanced placement? Are we providing them with opportunities? So they don't have to hit all of these in the blue box. Correct. Okay. Yes, thank you. I was thinking, oh, wow. Okay. And that's why even... We want them to. Correct. And that's why this helps us in terms of um, our school at 53%, um, LEOC is at 38 and the state's at 42 um, so that's why we want to make sure that our students, when they come in, they're at least meeting, uh, meeting at minimum, the ADG requirements. Thank you. And the, the future goal is 100%? Yes, that is yeah. our ultimate end game, and we're at 50%. There you go. It's actually disappointing. No, 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 but compared to, I mean, I know we want to be better. Right. And I know that generally 
50 some odd percent is not as good as 100 percent, but 53 percent compared to the the peers that we just heard about were better than everybody else. It does. I'm not. I listen. I'm not arguing with you. Statement. I, 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 that's why we're accelerating. Right. That, that's that's why why we're hey, Leonard. Leonard. That's why our goal is 100 percent. Right. But but in terms of thinking about growth and having a growth mindset, yeah, we are ahead of the game as compared to everybody else. So it I should be it should be more it should be. Uh, easier for us to achieve 100 percent than any of our peers because we're already better off. I think that's the point. This is one of our first meetings where we're really not patting ourselves on the back. I agree, and which is a good thing. It's yes, good thing. because we're in college, ready to school. But mm -hmm. and, yeah. if if you've seen that, if you've seen anything, the level of rigor, right? You heard Francis talk about it. We have a level of rigor around our academic and educational product that we've asked to be a focus as a board that is now a front and center focus. That's all that's all I did then. Good stuff. Okay. I'm channeling my innermost Julie really Grace right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you you've already talked about the fact that you're One hundred percent of our students graduating go on within four years. Bobby shared a little bit why that four years is important. It falls in LAUSD metric. It also falls in CDE metric. And when they're graduating within the four years, we also want them to be college and career ready. Any of the other board members would like to provide perspective that we haven't heard from. Is this the measure? And we shared with you where are we now? Where, where do we want to go? It looks like we started to discuss retention and we teach but one of tracks that's still forthcoming. Yes, we that that's our fourth success criteria. I think okay. Leonard's pushing us forward. So we as a staff also discussed this one, talent recruitment and retention. And we talked about does this become a separate goal or similar to the conversation that we had where you subordinated facilities under accelerating student learning. And as we discussed it, we felt that this goal needs to be subordinated under student learning outcomes because how do we get there is with high quality talent. And one of the things that Bob's going to introduce, Rob's going to introduce, is this notion of retention versus high quality talent retention because those are two separate things. So the success criteria we'd like to introduce to you is 95% of retention of high quality talent. One of the statistics that I brought to the board was Usually, California, the average is 90% teacher retention in school districts. However, we also know internationally at those organizations that are meaning beyond one year's growth in one year's time, the retention is above 95%. So that's where we're headed for eight, and then 100% of talent recruitment to be filled by school starting new teacher or orientation. And Rob has some data that he would like to share with you. Okay, so this is our data on retention. This is for the, the teacher retention for the last two years, so 17, 18, 18, 19. Um, I pulled up data from the 2010-2011, all the way back to 2010-2011 school year. What I found was every year from, from those years, 10-11 to this year, it all, well, from 17-18, the teacher retention fell in the 70 to 80%. There was an outlier in 15-16 when 47% of the teachers left. So that was the only year um, that it wasn't between the 70 and 80% range. If you look at this between um, 17 and 18, um, you'll see that it's very similar with ACES um, and ta TAS. Yeah, you'll see it's very similar. Um, the difference is here was um, the high school, which lost 10 teachers last year and three teachers this year. So um, that was the big difference right here. If you look at the trend over the data that I was looking, um, definitely the highest um, rate, um, the highest retention rate um, was ACEs. Um, there was a couple of years where they didn't lose any teachers. Um, and then the highest uh, the teachers that are leaving was always the high school. So this is really good when we're looking at 18, 19 this year. Are these pure unfiltered numbers we didn't count out people or moved out of the area or people we didn't want or it just it's it's everybody this is numbers. It's everybody. It's everything from a non renewal to leaving leaving to, to having uh, credential yeah, issues. And I'll tell you and I'll, and I'll focus on that piece right now. 
We get zero money. That was part of the contract. Yeah. That was part of the cheese. Well, on our, on our, that's the cheese case. I understand, but that was on our side, but that didn't mean that they couldn't. Right, so okay. some of these folks have left. So Julie Weinlot, for instance, right. who was one of our union persons, she's moved closer to home. Got it. And took a pay cut. She sent me a very nice email thanking the board and would like to express that she's moving closer to home, but actually it was a pay cut in her. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, just to kind of give a, um, a snapshot of the teachers that left this year. So um, it was the whole gamut. Um, we had a we had a, a teacher that did not meet the credentialing requirement this year, um, so was not able to return. Um, we had two personal retirements, um, and actually one just recent, which is why we have one of those teaching positions open. Um, most, uh, again, most of them were teachers that left the area got a job closer to home, seven teachers. Uh, Julia Weinrat was a, a perfect example of that. Um, and then we had, we had one teacher that left the state to continue education, and then we had one teacher that was promoted, Rosemary McCluskey, actually was promoted, so there was a vacancy there. So we really had a, a gamut. Um, we have, the, on the offboarding process, we do have an exit interview um, as part of it. Um, and um, so what we found from that was that those were the, 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 the teachers that left. It was, it was because of the commute. I mean, some people were, had some really brutal commutes, and Julia was one of them from Simi Valley. So, um, we do have uh, three teaching positions that were unfilled at the start of the school year. The ELD um, resignation, actually retirement, were, came late. Um, we just, uh, actually there's two right now, because our, our science Spanish teacher um, just started uh, yesterday, actually. And we still have a math vacancy as well, and I know Rosie's been in here. I will say this, when we talk about high quality instruction, and I've been here um, a couple months now, I cannot give enough credit to our principals and their teams um, for the interview process. Francis, you know, uh, Rosie and uh, Patty, um, they, it's not that they weren't interviewing and they didn't have candidates. It wasn't that. It was the fact that they would not settle for the candidates that, that they were interviewing. They interviewed all summer. A great example, and, and Francis, I'm going to use this example. So we had, we had three ELA, middle school ELA vacancies. We could not fill it. And it's not because he didn't have candidates. It was because they, they had such a high expectation level that they just had continued to continue to interview. And uh, we really believe that we got three superstars, actually. A month ago, we didn't have any teachers. Now we have three. And, and that, that's just an example. But um, when we're talking about high quality instruction, um, we do, the, the bar is up here. Um, we are not settling. And that's, that's you know, and, and Rosie, that was an example. I mean, we, yeah, we, just, we filled that Spanish um, position um, just recently, but we weren't going to settle for a teacher. We didn't feel that it was, um, was not high quality. So. Was compensation an issue during the process? Do you feel that our compensation levels are such that we can attract high quality? It, it became an issue a couple times. Yes, it did. It did become an issue. Yeah, yeah. We had we had several teachers that uh, yeah did not accept the position. In what category? Well, at ELA. That, that, yeah, but ELA middle school ELA, which is usually well, it is a difficult position to fill. Any middle school position. Is there any recommendation about that? Should we be offering more? So um, he's going to talk about that. Okay. Just to jump ahead of it. We were able to successfully uh, market the fact that we have a retention bonus right. for our CBA, which have to help. And we have um, we a signing bonus um, as an incentive for them to sign. So uh, those factors all combine to a successful hiring. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It helped a lot. Okay. It did. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone have any questions on this? So um, most of us that were getting hired on emergency credentials lasted two years. I think that was the average. LA Unified probably one year. I was in a Title I school, and I can tell you there's three things that I needed to survive to continue um, in education those first years. Um, one of them was I wanted to work in a collaborative culture because I wanted to feel like I was part of the team. The second thing is, is I, wanted the, I wanted the district to be able to give me the tools to succeed, to give me that training, because um, I hadn't hit the ground running. And the third thing is that I wanted administrative support. 
Those are three things that actually, to this day, are still, I believe, the three critical components to keeping our teachers, because I was one of them. So one of the things, um, that, you know, and, and Francis did a great job up at the podium talking about this, was the, the professional development and what a difference um, it is this year. Um, so we focus on professional development, giving the teachers those tools, ongoing, um, having annual goals on that. And I just wanted to, to read just a, a couple things with our professional development this year. I've had the opportunity to walk through um, on some of their walkthroughs, and it's really cool. The feedback, it is, it, it's, it's amazing. So basically, the over, overarching focus this year, it's the, the learning through student dialogue, not teacher monologue, right? So it's the teachers, the, the students doing the talking, and the students being engaged. Um, it's a, it's a research-based, the research-based instructional strategies to support rigorous student-to-student -student interactions. And this is the key to it. And when I went back and I talked about the, the support from administration, the great thing about this program is it's immediate feedback from the administrators and then the support that comes with it through coaching. So it's a great, great model. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really cool to see. Um, and the other thing is, like I talked about before, it supports the collaboration and it provides opportunities for teachers to align their practices not only across grade levels but, but departments. So going back to what I talked about was a collaborative culture that is really needed for us to retain our teachers. Um, the next thing, the, the, the C3, I, I don't know what else to say. I know Dr. Quinn talked about it. I don't want to repeat anything. I think that the, the really neat part about it, um, about this framework that was created, was that it was, it was done in a collaborative model with teachers and administrators. Um, and it, it's focused on dialogue, right? It's focused much more on dialogue than a punitive evaluation system because anybody who's been um, a teacher, anybody who's been a principal, you know the most important thing um, as far as teacher performance is an effective evaluation process. So um, it's really exciting that, that, we're, that we're putting that together and I can't emphasize enough how, how really outstanding that it is that it's done in a collaborative model and it's, and it's based on dialogue. Um, employee recognition, um, that's been a big focus um, of, as, as far as setting our goals. This year, um, and it's the, the most important piece of this is the ongoing employee recognition. Instead of doing the beginning of the year, we did we gave the teachers these really cool water bottles and all you know all that, and we have other things planned. Um, and then doing maybe like a winter thing, something like that, and then at the end of the year, um, our our goal as an organization is to do it continuously throughout the year. So. Um, well, one of the things that, that we're going to do, you know, instead of doing uh, employee of the year, you know, classified employee of the year, teacher of the year, we're looking at doing it monthly, actually, to recognize our employees monthly. Um, the other thing is, is um, we actually each department actually took a month to do something to um, recognize our employees. So we're going to do it throughout the, the year, right? Human resources last September, we're still coming up with some ideas of what we're gonna do, you know, either you know, put something in that the teachers on. We're still in the planning stages of that. But the, the idea is is to to recognize our employees throughout the year. And that is a that's a goal um, that we're doing. So here we talk Thank you. So just a uh, uh, piggyback on Rob. Uh, our operation team consists of human resources, business, IT facilities. And we're coming together as a belief that we are here to support the school. We're not here to run the school, we're here to support the school. So we're reading this book, um, Creating book. Extraordinary Best place. place to Work. Yes. Best Place to Work, Best thank you, Tom. So we're really taking some ideas to see how we can implement that to really build the culture of the school. Um, which, uh, again, the employee recognition is part of it, but also really to think outside the box of, uh, and going beyond compensation. Obviously, money helps. It does. That's probably the number one reason why people need to work. Is to uh, but we're also looking at things, additional things like the signing bonus, the referral bonus. Uh, one thing that we also did uh, different this year, we're, we're looking at providing unique benefits to not only the teachers but also to all employees. So we made a radical shift in, in, in our decision process this year. We uh, decided to provide basic medical coverage for uh, for just the employee only at zero cost. So basically for medical and dental and vision, they pay zero out of pocket. Um, and that I think was really well received by our employees at the beginning of the year. 
And, and those little things that really get to show and help our employees to appreciate, or show our appreciation to our employees that we want to take care of them long term, as opposed for them to just you know, come and work for us. Um, we're also looking at uh, other things like longevity sympathetical for teachers who have it. Um, as we all know, uh, we work 12 months, we push, it feels like 13 months. Um, and you know, sometimes it's not enough time for us to recharge. And, and those things and those ideas will help us to re rejuvenate our work staff and help them to be refreshed um, for the upcoming years. So those are some of the uh, things uh, that we're going to think outside the box. Uh, we certainly welcome ideas and different platforms that we can really show our employees' appreciation to what they, how they serve our kids here at the classroom. I'd like to um, just throw out there that uh, the C3 committee would be, very, would be very welcoming to any ideas that you have about criteria for multi-year contracts, since that's out of the box for us. So the fourth success criteria that we're introducing to you is talent around talent recruitment and retention. Um, board members, where, where are you thinking in terms of feedback on this particular success criteria? Are we headed in the right direction? Well, speaking from this side of the table, not only are we headed in the right direction here, but I would say just about everything that I'm seeing, you know, I can go back over the past 12 or 18 months and have a different organization. And I'm really proud of the progress that everybody's made. I mean, I just kind of quantum leap. In the last year, or would you say three months, Peter? I would say uh, 18 months. Yeah. 12 months. 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Um, I agree. I'm not sure there's more to say. Yeah, professionalism of the organization and uh, commitment, it's great to see. Increasing talent, increasing transparency, uh, data driven, intentional, thoughtful, measured, holding ourselves accountable. Thank you for expressing that verbally, publicly, because I think our staff is working very hard at the top office hours, and we're really coming together as a team. Yeah, the teamwork. Yeah, the teamwork. Yeah. So to some, yes, I'll add something to that. I, I add that the specific kind of uh, shift to the hiring juncture, rather than let's try to help everybody later, is a very welcome shift because it, it that that's a good juncture to be filtering. You know, and I appreciate the specifics that you offered about working with the principals to, to make that happen. I think we can also incentivize by and, and reward people. I've seen something that is really effective when you call out specific talents. Mm -hmm. So instead of having like the teacher of the month, the most innovative teacher mm -hmm. of the year, or the most um, uh, what are some connected to the parent community? And you're right, the the most yeah exactly community oriented you know something like that. Give it some sort of professional terminology, but that tends to recognize these kinds of that with that growth mindset. It's the talents that we're trying to cultivate, not punish what they're not doing well at, but say, hey, you've been really innovative, and then other people say, hmm, maybe I can. Similarly, do something like that. Or maybe I just work on what I'm already succeeding at and do better. Specificity with the employee recognition. Yeah, specificity. So we're going to summarize the four success criteria that we brought to the board. Early literacy, growth measure, all students growing, achievement at the end at our high school, and then around our talent recruitment and retention with teachers and also talent at home levels. Next steps for us would be, um, first, we want to go back to those goals because we're at 100% and that's our end game. So what is a realistic goal for us? Because a SMART goal has to be specific, measurable, and attainable. So currently we're discussing what's the most attainable for us with um, an aggressive goal. The second one is a mid-year progress report. So now that we have some success indicators, as somebody mentioned, we don't want to wait until the end of the year to report on the progress, because reporting out to the board members also keeps us accountable. So we would like to share with you a mid-year account report, probably around our December board meeting. 
The third would be success criteria for board goal number two, so that we went very narrow on one goal, academics, but communication was also another thread that we had uh, last time we spoke, so we're gonna be bringing back to you board success criteria for communication at the next board meeting, and we would, what we would like the board members to start thinking about, because it came up in your discussion, Larry, you said finance committee, finance work weaves itself throughout all of this, so how does now our work of our board committees, including our parent advisory committee, how do we laser-like focus their goals on um, alignment with our academic goal? And so this would be the next steps from the CEO and our staff. And very pleased to share with you, we kind of already launched this with our teachers, so we have this new theme, it's called Press on the Accelerator. Uh, within our organization, you may see that. We're going to start adding it to our glossary because we have a new acronym now, Julie. It's called POTA. P-O-T-A. Care of uh, Mia. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Julie, we started adding pictures. I know, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> we're, we're moving on to the next layer. If you'd like to take the org chart with you, this is actually in your binder, Mia. Is it under presentation and reports? Yes. Yep. And we'll be sharing uh, more with that. Then Kong, would you mind sharing with them briefly about the website and taking any feedback from our board members on our website? Yes. This is our new website. Right. So this is like, and I want to first show you the view that we have on our website. Um, these are current and former students that's in the video. Thinking the language immersion program at ACES really helped build this foundation where I can now converse about all the subjects I love in English and in Spanish. I found myself not wanting to take a leave, but Paige pushed me, and I felt that safety, so it like really made me feel at home and made me easier to learn. The word accelerated here is kind of said to me that they want you to be more than just a regular student, they want you to be extraordinary. The reason that I push uh, myself to pass my own is because I've been in this school, because everyone told me I could do more than I thought I could. The teachers actually like have one-on-one -on -one with you and they push the student to exceed and learn more things and be eager to learn to walk from the school the next day. And once you have that foundation, you really just love that community and you want to come back. I'm considering maybe immigration law someday, or maybe become a DA, I don't know what the future calls, but I really want to come back and just give back to the whole community. As you grow, you kind of realize that things need to change, and sometimes you have to do that change. At the Accelerated School, you really, your teachers really help you find your limits and then to step beyond them. So, um, our site now is a lot more focused on our school and our, our organization, um, more, promoting more to potential students and families. Um, but also serve as a channel uh, that is uh, for our current um, students as well. So these are the areas. Um, so we have family resource. Uh, we have calendars now with all the school events uh, listed uh, here. But this is a global view. However, uh, if you go to each school, you will see the events here where. Uh, Parents or anybody can check. Um, 
So, who keeps it current? Excuse me? Who keeps it current? Right now, um, Molina and Kong and Mia. All the uh, information now from the board is in the family download and link section. So you will see board reading materials. That's what you will find now uh, for the materials now. Uh, and you see the one from <laughs> Can we go back to um, Peter's uh, board of trustees? Go, go back to Yeah, I think it's firm name. This is okay. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, it is. Okay. No. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> you guys fix it. It is. It is. It is. It is. That's a brand new question. So, yeah, yeah. just uh, take off that associates. Oh, okay. That's okay. Uh, Other than that's great. Right. Uh, Gavin was missing last night. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just no One thing no ad associates. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is ready. Then I, Thank you. You know, I, I mentioned this when we sent this to the release on If you don't have the, our donors here, and every organization that you know accepts donations yes. typically has their medical donors listed. Yes. And I don't see it, and I think it's wrong. Yes. Um, so I would be meeting with them um, to replenish our website. Right. I pushed back twice on that, and um, the professional recommendation was if we're doing some more work with fundraising, that the donor list, when we put it on our website, that we look too well in we look too, I'm sorry? We look too well-funded. That it would actually distract other people from wanting to... I think it's ridiculous. It, it, you know, every organization you look at, I think people like to... It also validates the fact that some of the donors we have, it's not because we had a big party somewhere in Hollywood yes. and Brad Pitt was there. We have donors that put us through a rigorous evaluation. Yes. And you have Wells Fargo, you have Amber, uh, I've been just for years. Yes, that's not Greece's recommendation. That was actually the professional yeah. recommendation. From I mean, I, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but I think we need to, you know, we need to correct okay. that. Could that issue be solved through language? Um, I mean, why does it have? Why does it have to be called? Why do we have to describe it or characterize it as well funded? It can just be you know, a thing. Well, we're not going to say we're well funded, but yeah, we, we want well, to make it. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I feel like, that you know, it, it, for instance, if, if we do go at both parishes in Africa, yeah, yeah. We, if we go to them and, and they give us a, a significant gift, I think their expectation is that they're going to be listed. Can we start with, can we start with um, our funders without the dollar amount? I think that was also a big red flag from um, Melina. Let's look at what other like organizations are doing and, and, and see if you want me in on the conversation. I, would, yes, I don't think we have to do dollar amounts, but you know, typically whether you walk into a hospital or, or you know, a theater, you know, you see categories of people. Yeah, I mean, it could be by category. Okay. Well, we're going to list with them. Right. Any other feedback on our website? Yes. Yeah. Well, we can't get into the student or staff section, but from what I'm seeing it looks good. It's a good improvement. Well, if our pictures are going to be up there, would the Board of Trustees mind if we took their pictures at our next board meeting to have up on our website as well? Glad you mentioned that. So that'll be October. So, you know, everyone, we're we're into the last. Can we provide pictures, or do you want some consistency? <laughs> We, none of us got a pic at our headshots. It was it was all curated. Well, that's you. I sent you a photo. Thank you. Yeah. I had mine take off for that student photo day, so. We're going to move really quickly through facilities. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Thanks for providing the folder at the end so I can pull out my things and not have to take the notebook with me. Thank you, Dan. Do you want that folder? 
presentation in five minutes. I just wanted to give a quick uh, update as to our facilities and to our financials. Um, so this is, uh, again, we'll be covering just really high level items that we're doing from um, uh, here at the school and our operations level. First, the facilities update. Um, I really appreciate the discussion as to focusing on learning and accelerate the learning here at the school. Uh, and, but it's also important to make sure we focus on facilities. So one thing that we're going to be focusing on, um, actually upcoming, is we're going to do... Is it's not propagating yet? Yes, it's not. It's not. It's, okay. It's, it just went correctly. Sorry. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be focusing on a security study um, this upcoming month. It's just to evaluate the security risks in and around the campus. Great. So it's really important, again, with uh, certain... Um, external factors that have been arising um, as of late. Um, and that's really important to make sure we uh, provide a safe and secure campus at all hours. Um, again, mid to late September, we're going to have um, an outside consultant come in for about a few days to just really poke holes in everything, everything from soup to nuts to make sure we have everything covered. So again, this is just for information only. Second part. Uh, in conjunction with the security study, we're actually going to do a space study as well. Uh, much needed discussion. Uh, Tom has been procuring uh, some vendors, or we we'll look to move forward on um, a proposal within the next two weeks. I want to say we just need to get a, a, an assessment of all classroom and office usage across campus, and then that should take place during the autumn of 2019. Part of the space study is looking at capacity. Uh, due to the creativity of our admin and our facilities, we've juggled around a few things, but we're still brimming at the, at the bulges, so to speak. So on, your, on the consent items is a proposal to add four temporary classrooms in order to relieve classroom congestion. It's that tile game that Tom alluded to back in April that we need to create capacity in order to start moving things around to just making sure we provide adequate classroom coverage. Um, we're asking for, um, uh, and we'll cover that during the consent items, but it's really to add classroom space so that we really can address some of our um, short-term facility issues. This is still a phased approach. This is by no means a permanent situation. We just need to make sure we have Four classrooms on the empty lot by Woodlock. So we can look at the space study, then we can redesign our space, and then hopefully have a longer term plan as to adding more permanent structures um, in and around the campus. So. It seems like it's a very big number for a permanent. And they also then use the term rental. So the, what was it? It was $247,000. What, is, what are we spending that on? So it's for four portable classroom spaces to be put on there. It includes room, the um, installation and removal and all the applicable permits. And the rental? And the rental. Uh, for what period of time? For how long, Tom? Two years? Really expensive. If, uh, if we want to, we can um, look around. It's a little difficult because this is more of a... Uh, it's like a sole source supplier. Right. It's a, you know? it's, and it's a district requirement it, as well. Is it a district requirement? Does it include laboratories? And no. There's no plumbing on the portable unit. So where would the students go to the bathroom? There's um, the tech center. Is just our, uh, right. And the regular restrooms. We're just opening up the campus to the So And space. how do you access those buildings? From the campus? Yes. Yeah. And we will include the security evaluation to include that proposed Correct. So you walk down that way. Where the play field is, that fence would be gone. Yes. And, and there would be a fence around here. Correct. Correct. And what about use permits? Are we 
That's, that's part of this whole process. Okay. That's when we engage uh, uh, the contractor to prep the space. And it would be a stepped approach. If, if Correct. you fail to use permit, we would have to pay the rest of the money. Correct. 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 We want to approach this now in August so we can fortunately have it up and running by 2020. And January. What, how much revenue is the pool for classroom to generate over the two years? It will not generate revenue. It is just helping us to leave um, our space issues. So no new revenue, but even just looking at the students of the past, how much revenue comes out of those uh, As we're looking at uh, building additional capacity um, on the high school, uh, we certainly have some space. So each additional student we can add, um, again, it's... I know I understand right now this is just to move the chess pieces around, but how many students does it have? 120. And I'm, I'm just curious, how much revenue is 120 generating that? Have you done that? So that's uh, multiplied by 12, 100, or about a million? A million four. So, uh, we can... And, and one, one last question. Is, is it proposed that they just single story? Yes. Yeah. Is there a reason why we're not doing two stories? That'd be a permanent structure. These are portable mobile units. So you can't, they don't have two story they, portable? No. That would be in our phased approach. Like we, this could almost be leased to own. These could be the units we end up using for the permanent structure. Mm -hmm. That's what we can negotiate with the uh, supplier. Yeah. It seems so expensive to rent these units for two years. Yeah. Okay. But certainly in our classrooms, we have literally two classrooms adjacent to each other. Um, I visited actually during the first week, and right. the noise is, it's, it's but, almost I, like our I'm not questioning the need, I'm questioning the expense, and, the, and we're winning it. I mean, I, I can't even imagine we have that much to buy. No, but that will be a, a longer discussion once we have the space study right. analysis done. But can we, can we do a partial approval? to approve, to initiate the process of getting, making sure we can get the permit, and also to study um, alternatives to this expense that, that seems very high for what it is. Sure. And, and, yeah. It, sure. Do you think I'm wrong about mm. the expense? No, that's where we need your expertise. Certainly, uh, we don't need to pay the full amount. We can certainly do this in increments to make sure we're all fully satisfied. We can report back out at the next board meeting once we've um, looked at the entire figuring, which includes the space analysis, to get a better sense. So, and is it, can I hear you say there's some requirement by LAUSD that we must use this vendor? No, not this vendor, but this type of structure. Well, we've got to get more bids. These are DSA approved units that are set for schools. Uh, there were three companies that I interviewed. This was the only one that could that could produce and develop. They use, they don't build these to suit or they become more expensive. These are existing units that companies have. We had strict criteria. They needed to be 25 to 30 by 40 feet. You know, all of our criteria was met by that. Um, yeah, this is, it's, 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 got it's a rarefied group. You just gotta, you know, spend a little more time. Right, but again, like I say, these could be the actual units that we permanently set on that parcel. We're just not determined yet whether we're going to be one parcel or two parcels, uh, how our layout is going well, to be. Or a single. do we want, is that what we, the kind of housing or you know, the kind of questions we want? In, in the end, we probably want to build, maybe we can build you know, two stories. That's uh, about twice the cost. We did the analysis, yeah. I this understand, is, but we don't need more land. Correct. So, so we could do these two story, we could get eight units on that one parcel. But and not, these, these but would not, be not the units. This particular type and not renting. Correct. Or we could build a building. If we bought eight of these units and encased them in a, like we did, like they did on the D buildings for the WAS classrooms, those are portable modular units that have been encased in a permanent structure. Right. We could do that. They're $36,000 a piece. So if they're $36,000 a piece, why are we paying $260,000 for two of them? No, no, no. Oh, they're uh, it, it, per classroom. Per classroom. So we we're getting four units. Correct. For two years. 
But then thirty-six thousand dollars a piece. The math's not working out. That's one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, for yeah, but the saying we could them. buy that at thirty-six thousand. You said. We Correct. can buy these things. We could buy four of them for about a hundred and forty some thousand dollars, or we rent them, four of them for a hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. But what do we do with them if we don't? If so, our expansion plan doesn't get rid of them, can we sell them? That's a very difficult. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, know don't sell. Them. Yeah, we give them away. Yeah. I mean, I, it makes no sense to All spend two sixty right. when we get it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let me ask So. Uh, Given that it sounds, it, it, look, you've spoken to three companies. Mm -hmm. It sounds like one of the three is capable of getting us meeting, our, meeting our needs. Right. The yes. other two can't, regardless of the price, right? Correct, correct. Are there other companies that we can go and talk I, to? I, ex I looked everywhere. And there is. It's so that, very that's, limited. That's part of For the Southern California, yeah. It's a very limited. Okay. Uh, if we don't approve this consent item, what does that do to your timeline to have these up and running by January 2020? That would be a very tough. We would push it to summer of next year. What about buying them? I, I, I'm still having a really hard time understanding why we would rent something at twice the cost of acquiring them. Of course, really, it's, 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 it sounds like it's the same. It's the same. Because it's two years, don't forget, so you're more right. unlikely. No, how much, is, how much does it cost to buy four? Four years? units times 36 is 120 plus. To acquire. Uh, Right, and then it's two years. Oh, to acquire, that's true, actually. Yeah, because then we have Then you own them. No, you're right. So, Why yeah, right? so that's, you know what, you're actually right. <laughs> Shockingly. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. So, wait, so we buy it for half the price. Yeah. Why would we rent something for twice? Okay, the we're going around, we've heard the same thing three times. Three times. So. I'm hearing this as a bring back item from staff. No, he's right. Mm -hmm. It's a bring back item. It's a We'll bring it back at the next board. But on the other hand, can we give them consent if they can acquire them for 120 and just go and do it? We can. It's just, again, what we don't have a long-term strategic plan. Uh, we need to address short-term facility right. needs right now. If, the, if we do have consent to buy, we can certainly look at it and then bring this up um, perhaps at the uh, It would be much easier to go to the district with that proposal than simply, we're not sure yet. Right. If we buy them, we got them, we'll deal with them. What's the downside to buying them? That we can't use them for some reason? Or we use them and then we got to get rid of them? Actually, four them. out of our five options include those units. So we're really good on it. I would so feel very comfortable buying them. What, if you buy them for 36000 a piece, do you still have to pay to get them installed? Or Correct. Include installation? Yeah, there's site preparation and all of that. So but still, and the 267 included all that? Yes. Correct. Okay, so... so Four times thirty-six isn't the cost of buying them; it's more. Yeah, probably would add another five. Right, but still, it's going to still be less than the cost of renting. Yes, it will come okay. up roughly the same. We just don't have to deal with the, any of the uh, depreciation and disposal. Right. If I may recommend, our next board meeting is in September. I think we we're going to need to bring this back to the council to have more information. Just don't want to hurt your time. Sure. No. The, the timeline is aggressive to be spring anyway. Um, Mid-year is, is always aggressive. Next summer, we would feel very comfortable having them in place by then. Here's the other thing. If, if you guys can do a little bit of a deeper dive on the financial impact analysis, mm -hmm. there's nothing that stops us from having a special board meeting to consider sure. if you want to accelerate the timeline. So sure. We don't have to actually wait until September if you guys can get it done. We can all get on a phone call. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, speaking of financials, uh, I'm just going to bring this really quickly. These are the other financials that we report to LUC uh, this past couple weeks. These are, I'm just going to breeze through this because they're not final. In fact, our auditors are here uh, this week uh, looking at everything to finalize that final number. But uh, I'm just going to report that although we are um, significantly out of budget, we are still fiscally sound. Everything I've disclosed in the previous board meetings it still holds true. Uh, the work stoppage, uh, spend costs, nothing's really changed since the last board meeting. Do you have a copy of that in here? Yes. Mm -hmm. You do. Sure. Should be on the Yeah. Okay. Sure. So the auditors are here now. They are here now. 
Okay. Who's on the audit committee? This is from myself and maybe still on it. I believe so. And let us know when we need to. These were on the website as well. Yeah, the yes. board packets do, Thank do you. get posted. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, probably by the end of this week, once I wrap up with the auditors, I'll have uh, something to report out. Any questions regarding the financials? Again, these are just unaudited numbers. These will change once we uh, finalize the audit. Vincent, when does XED start doing the financial reports? Thank you. The uh, XED actually started as of January 1st, uh, July 1st, I'm sorry. Um, they uh, have started doing our payables. Um, we're uh, transitioning on to do the rest of the accounting. Um, so by the next board meeting, a uh, formal board meeting in October, they should be here to report out first quarter results. Okay, moving, moving along. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent, and all of the other presenters. Okay, the org chart, yay. Okay, so moving right along, we're at the consent item. So we are, let me guess, we're pulling five out of there. Correct. Yeah, so the consent items, we shall, we will pull out five for further consideration. Okay. Are there any questions as to the consent items that we have to say? These need to be approved, so I need a motion. Payroll provider. Can there be a little discussion on that? Absolutely. So currently we run payroll through LACO, mm -hmm. which is an antiquated system from I want to say. We understand the need to so what let's talk about the decision to get the party to be paid. So KCOM is actually in line with that set. I actually have personal experience with KCOM. So PayCom is, is that the provider that XED uses? Okay. Yeah, it's similar to ADP, but um, they, uh, my personal uh, experience with Paycom has been fairly pleasant with uh, my previous school. Um, they provide self-service approach for the employees, um, much better real-time data, uh, time to attendance. Issues that uh, really are, um, that both from a human resource and a business service perspective, we need to tackle. Um, do they provide this is exclusively nonprofit or do they do both? They do everything. How many uh, payrolls do they provide? I don't have the number on top of my head, but they do deal with schools. Um, I know with XED, uh, working with Paycom, they have roughly a dozen, I want to say. So it's um, like 100,000 plus, or you know, uh, maybe even in, in millions. Yeah. Would, would these topics be something for the audit committee or the finance committee? No, I mean, <laughs> you're being asked to vote on it, but, and, and you, I know, but if a committee has addressed it before the board, uh, we can get recommendations from you rather than questions. Might have been helpful, but we're here, so. So, um, and, and, and the cost compared to LACO? Uh, LACO is roughly, I want to say, twelve to 15,000. Right. Whereas here we're looking at 40, well, 48, 45,000. And the reason we're using them rather than having XED do it? Because uh, LACO does a number, LACO's been able to tackle the CalSTRS issues. Right. You know? Whereas PayCom, it's a little bit cumbersome, but they've been managed to be able to provide that interaction with CalSTRS. Uh, plus, it's a much better platform, whereas LACO's still cost based. No, I mean, the reason, Why not, not the reason we let everybody back with LACO, why are we going independently to this vendor as opposed to doing it through XED? Um, it's actually been something I've been thinking about previous to our discussion with XA. Right. Um, and at the same time, it, it allows us to have a better flexibility, um, whereas um, it removes that extra third party coordination. We can uh, deal payroll on a much more flexible, real time basis. So if an employee needs a check or an employee needs, we can deal with it correctly. And have we checked how much it would cost us to use them under the umbrella of XED? Maybe It'd be roughly the same. It's the same. Are you sure about that? Because the costs are the same. And XED, are they providing our CalSTRS information? They're not. That's not part of the contract. If we haven't had a migrate, that would be pretty simple. It's the same thing. If we need to. And you, 
do you get to another bid? I've tried. I reached out to two other companies, and surprisingly, I have not found a response back. I noticed that you wrote that. That you both have a with this firm. I'm confident because of my previous experience. Right. Um, I showed it to the staff actually previous to Rob, and uh, again, just everything we can do, electronic onboarding, time and attendance, it's actually things that we need desperately. The total number of employees will be 200. 200. And you feel it's competitive? Yes. It is. Compared to, say, ADP's rate? ADP would be a significant higher from, from what I From that number? For 200 employees? Okay. Okay, that was my question. <laughs> okay. Okay, so are we leaving that on the consent item? Yeah. Okay, um, I need a motion to approve the consent item. We can, we, we can do them as a group? Yep, consent. All the good. Second. Okay. Um, Other than five. Other, Other than five. five. One through four, right. Right, so um, any more discussion or questions? Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent items, please say aye. One, two, three, four, aye. aye. One, two, three, four, not five. Okay, and everyone voted for that, so okay, there you go. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like we may have a special meeting um, about the facilities. I think we'll try and think about that. Okay, uh, moving right along, we're going to adjourn to closed session now.